Hi guys, Cold Dane here. I am uh, in my childhood bedroom at my mum's house at the moment, hence the change of scenery. Might not finish all of this review here because I only have so much battery space, uh, camera space left. But anyway, today I'm going to be talking about My Uncle Oswald by Roald Dahl. This is a novel. There are actually some Uncle Oswald short stories that I've read as well. Um, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say this is very not safe for work and definitely not to be confused with Dahl's kids books. You will see why as we get to the plot. Dane reads... Volume XX of the Diaries of Oswald Hendricks Cornelius, word for word as he wrote it. Aside from being thoroughly debauched, strikingly attractive and astonishingly wealthy, Uncle Oswald was the greatest bounder, bon vivant and fornicator of all time. In this instalment of his scorchingly frank memoirs, he tells of his early career and erotic education at the hands of a number of enthusiastic teachers, of discovering the invigorating properties of the Sudanese blister beetle, and of the gorgeous Yasmin Howcomely, his electrifying partner in a most unusual series of thefts. So, we're going to get to those unusual series of thefts, but it involves semen. So, this uh, opening paragraph here is a great little, uh, I guess, introduction to who Uncle Oswald was and what his life was like. I'm beginning once again to have an urge to salute my Uncle Oswald. I mean, of course, Oswald Hendricks Cornelius Deceased, the connoisseur, the bon vivant, the collector of spiders, scorpions and walking sticks, the lover of opera, the expert on Chinese porcelain, the seducer of women and without much doubt the greatest fornicator of all time. Every other celebrated contender for that title is diminished to a point of ridicule when his record is compared with that of my Uncle Oswald, especially poor old Casanova. He comes out of the contest looking like a man who was suffering from a severe malfunction of his sexual organ. So this is Uncle Oswald as a young man writing in his journal, so he wrote, Already, you see, I had begun to acquire a taste for rakery and wenching among the London debutantes. Already, also, I was beginning to get a bit bored with these young English girls. They were, I decided, a pretty pithless lot, and I was impatient to sow a few bushels of wild oats in foreign fields, especially in France. I had been reliably informed that Parisian females knew a thing or two about the act of lovemaking that their London cousins had never even dreamed of. Copulation, so rumour had it, was at its infancy in England. So here we learn about the Beatles that are like the core uh, of this plot, really. Um, so this is a major, I'm not sure what the major's name was, just the major. But, he, but there we go. Why is it so secret, we asked. These little Beatles, the major said, are found only in one part of the sedan. It's an area of about 20 square miles north of Khartoum, and that's where a tree called the Hashab grows. The leaves of the Hashab tree are what the beetles feed on. Men spend their whole lives searching for these beetles. Beetle hunters, they're called. They're very sharp-eyed natives who know all there is to know about the haunts and habits of the tiny brutes. And when they catch them, they kill them and dry them in the sun and crunch them up into a fine powder. This powder is greatly prized among the natives, who usually keep it in small, elaborately carved beetle boxes. A tribal chief will have his beetle box made of silver. Um, and basically, sorry, my eyes just lit up on a racist word there as well, so we're not going to reference that. It was the W one for uh, those who are interested. There is a little bit of racism here. Um, but yeah, so this, this powder of the beetle, it's like Viagra, but 10 times more powerful, basically. And so, yeah, the major, he ends up trying some of this stuff. Um, and uh, he has to, he goes, uh, they put me to bed and packed ice all around my poor throbbing member. Who did someone ask? Who's they? A nurse, the major answered. A young Scottish nurse with dark hair. She brought the ice in small rubber bags and packed it round and kept the bags in place with a bandage. Didn't you get frostbite? You can't get frostbite on something that's practically red hot, the Major said. What happened next? They kept changing the ice every three hours, day and night. Who, the Scottish nurse? They took it in turn, several nurses. Good God. It took two weeks to subside. Yeah, that's... Whew. Uh, and then we get this. Um, he's talking about the most repulsive dish, something that's eaten with gusto by jackaroos on sheep stations in Australia. So he writes... These jackaroos, and I might as well tell you about it so that you can avoid it if ever you should go that way. These jackaroos, or sheep cowboys, invariably castrate their male lambs in the following barbaric manner. Two of them hold the creature upside down by its fore and hind legs. A third fellow slits the scrotum and squeezes the testicles outside the sack. He then bends forward and takes the testicles in his mouth. He closes his teeth on them and jerks them free from the unfortunate animal and spits this nauseating mouthful into a basin. It's no good you telling me these things don't happen because they do. I saw it all last year with my own eyes on a station near Cowra in New South Wales. And these idiots went on to inform me with pride that three competent jackaroos could castrate 60 lambs in 60 minutes and go on doing it all day long. 
A little jaw ache was all one got, they said, but it was well worth it because the rewards were great. He'd, uh, he talks about something he learned from his father. He says, I began to realise how important it was to be an enthusiast in life. He taught me that if you are interested in something, no matter what it is, go at it full speed ahead. Embrace it with both arms, hug it, love it, and above all, become passionate about it. Lukewarm is no good. Hot is no good either. White, hot, and passionate is the only thing to be. And here we get, um, again, this is Uncle Oswald. He's a very sort of debauched character, but we get some of his attitudes towards women here. He says, um, The little trollop was waiting for me again. I decided not to go in. There was nothing new for me in there. Even at this early stage in my career, I had already decided that the only women who interested me were new women. Second time round was no good. It was like reading a detective novel twice over. You knew exactly what was going to happen next. We get this little exchange here. So this is going to teach you some new vocabulary that you cannot unlearn. And now we need, as it were, a tompion to protect the contents of this flask from invading bacteria. I presume you know what a tompion is, Cornelius. I can't say I do, sir, I said. Can anyone give me a definition of that common English noun? A.R. Worsley said. Nobody could. Then you'd better look it up, he said. It is not my business to teach you elementary English. Oh, come on, sir, someone said. Tell us what it means. A tompion, A.R. Worsley said, is a small pellet made out of mud and saliva which a bear inserts into his anus before hibernating for the winter to stop the ants getting it. Um, and so anyway, they devise this plan um, because they discover that the, this beetle powder or whatever, when it's, um, when it's like used or administered to people, they kind of go a bit mad with lust. Um, and so they discover that they decide on this plan. They're going to go around and find all these great men um, and then they're gonna give them a chocolate uh, with some of this powder in and then they're gonna go mad with lust They're gonna have sex with the lady who's in on the plan and then they're gonna save the sperm And then they're gonna sell it to people for like sperm donor stuff So they go to me. I mean, who is this? Who is this that they've gone to me? A.R. Worsley. Oh, do keep still Mr. Worsley. I'm not letting you come near me till I get this on talking about the condom I don't think he even heard her, and although he was clearly going mad with lust, he also gave the impression of a man who was in great discomfort. He was hopping, it appeared, because excessive irritation was taking place. Something was stinging him. It was stinging him so much he couldn't stand still. In greyhound racing, to make a dog run faster, they frequently insert a piece of ginger up its rectum, and the dog runs flat out in an effort to get away from the terrible sting in its backside. With A.R. Worsley, the sting was in a rather different part of his body, and the pain of it was making him hop, skip, and jump all over the lab. And at the same time, he was telling himself, or so it seemed, that only a woman could help him to get rid of that terrible sting. But the wretched woman was being too quick for him. He couldn't catch her, and the stinging feeling kept getting worse all the time. Goodness me. And then he takes his trousers down and it go, we get, uh, he simply could not stand still. Hobbled as he was by the trousers round his ankles, he went on hopping about and waving his arms and bellowing like a bull. For Yasmin, it must have been like trying to thread a needle on a sewing machine while the machine was still in motion. Here's how she gets the condom on as well. Finally, she lost patience and I saw her right hand, the one which was grasping, as it were, the handle of the tennis racket. I saw it give a wicked little flick. It was as though she were making a sharp backhand return to a half volley with a quick roll of the wrist at the end of the shot to impart topspin. A vicious wristy little flick it was, and it was certainly a winner because the victim let out a howl that rattled every test tube in the lab. It stopped him cold for five seconds, which gave her just enough time to get the rubbery thing on and then to jump back out of reach. I mean, I don't know how well this all holds up in the Me Too movement, you know, but I mean, the main character, the female, she's like a willing accessory to all of this. So they, off, they uh, go off to uh, visit, I think, Paris to visit Marcel Proust, Maurice Ravel, and James Joyce. And they go to uh, visit Proust. Uh, it goes, he was a snob. He was anti-Semitic. He was vain. He was a hypochondriac who suffered from asthma. He slept until four in the afternoon and stayed awake all night. So the four in the afternoon and stayed awake all night thing is a bit me. The rest, maybe not so much. And we get this great, just this couple of lines here. The art of copulation is like that of picking the nose. It's all right to be doing it yourself, but it is a singularly unattractive spectacle for the onlooker. And then, so then she goes to visit Freud and everything she's telling him here is basically the truth. So I said to him, something terrible is wrong with me, Dr. Freud. Something terrible and shocking. And what is that? He asked, perking up. He obviously enjoyed hearing about terrible and shocking things. You won't believe it, I said, but it is impossible for me to be in the presence of a man for more than a few minutes before he tries to rape me. He becomes a wild animal. He rips off my clothes. He exposes his organ. Is that the right word? It is as good a word as any, he said. Continue, Fraulein. He jumps on top of me, I cried. He pins me down. He takes his pleasure of me. Every man I meet does this to me, Mr. Freud. You must help me. I'm being raped to death. 
Dear lady, he said, this is a very common fantasy among certain types of hysterical women. These women are all frightened of having physical relations with men. Actually, they long to indulge in fornication and copulation and all other sexy frolics, but they are terrified of the consequences. So they fantasize. They imagine they are being raped. But it never happens. They are all virgins. No, no, I cried. You are wrong, Dr. Freud. I'm not a virgin. I'm the most over-raped girl in the world. You are hallucinating, he said. Nobody has ever raped you. Why you do not admit it and you will feel better instamatically. How can I admit it when it isn't true, I cried. Every man I've ever met has had his way with me. And it'll be just the same with you if I stay here much longer. You see if it isn't. Do not be ridiculous, Fraulein, he snapped. It will, it will, I cried. You'll be as bad as all the rest of them before the session's over. And of course, she gives them some of the chocolate, so it is. So then they go and visit H.G. Wells and Rudyard Kipling um, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle as well. So I'm just going to... Oh, and then Bernard Shaw at the end. So I'm going to read this whole little extract, actually. From Kent we drove to Crowborough in Sussex where we nobbled Mr. H.G. Wells. Not a bad sort of egg, Yasmin said when she came out. Rather portly and pontificating, but quite pleasant. It's an odd thing about great writers, she added. They look so ordinary. There's nothing about them that gives you the slightest crew to their greatness, as there is with painters. A great painter somehow looks like a great painter, but the great writer usually looks like the wages clerk in a cheese factory. From Crowborough we drove on to Rottingdean, also in Sussex, to call on Mr. Rudyard Kipling. Brissy little bugger, was Yasmin's only comment on that one. We were very much in the rhythm now, and the next day, in the same county of Sussex, we picked off Sir Arthur Conan Doyle as easily as picking a cherry. Yasmin simply rang the doorbell and told the maid who answered it that she was from his publishers and had important papers to deliver to him. She was at once shown into his study. What did you think of Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I asked her. Nothing special, she said. Just another writer with a thin pencil. Wait, I said, the next one on the list is also a writer, but I doubt you'll find this one boring. Who is he? Mr. Bernard Shaw. We had to drive through London to get to A. at St. Lawrence in Hertfordshire, where Shaw lived, and on the way I told Yasmin something about this smug literary clown. First of all, I said, he's a rabid vegetarian. He eats only raw vegetables and fruit and cereal, so I doubt he'll accept the chocolate. What do we do? Give it to him in a carrot? How about a radish? I suggested. Will he eat it? Probably not, I said, so it'd better be a grape. We'll get a good bunch of grapes in London and doctor one of them with the powder. And this last little excerpt I want to read out to you is about the duchy. So we get a, I do not usually sit in the bathtub at the wrong end with my back to the taps. Few people do. But on this particular afternoon, the other end, the comfortable slopey end, was occupied by a saucy little imp who possessed hyperactive carnal proclivities. That's why she was there. The fact that she happened also to be an English duchess is not entirely beside the point either. Had I been a few years older, I would have known what to expect from a female of high rank, and I'd have been a good deal less careless. Most of these women have acquired their titles by ensnaring some poor benighted peer or duke, and it takes a very special kind of mendacity and guile to succeed at that game. To become a duchess, you must be a prime manipulator of men. I have tangled with a fair number of them in my time, and they're all alike. Marchionesses and countesses are not quite so ghoulish, but they run the duchesses a close second. Dally with them by all means. It is a pecan experience. But for heaven's sake, keep your wits about you while you're at it. You never know. You positively never can tell when they're going to turn and bite the hand that strokes them. Watch out, I say, for the female with a grand title. So yeah, as you can imagine, very not safe for kids. Bits of it I think you would deem problematic in today's day and age, but it's written in a humorous way, and obviously if you remember it's fiction, I think it's alright. And I don't think Dahl is saying this is what you should go and do. It's just for the sake of the story, you know. Uh, I actually really enjoyed it. It's the only full-length Uncle Oswald novel that I know of. There might be others. I've read some of the short stories and I always enjoy them as well because he's just a such a crazy character. So I gave this one a solid four out of five. Would definitely recommend, obviously not to kids. If you have children and you, you've read them a lot of Roald Dahl, maybe read this one for yourself, but don't leave it lying around in case they pick it up because, you know. But yeah, a lot of fun. It's kind of the closest I think I've seen to like bizarro fiction in like classic literature. So I think that's pretty cool. Well, anyway, there you go. That's what I thought of My Uncle Oswald by Roald Dahl. As always, don't forget to let me know what you thought in the comments if you've read this book. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.